Hi, everyone. I am uh, I'm Dylan Richard. I was the director of engineering for uh, Obama for America, which is the 2012 re-election campaign. Um, today, I'm going to give you a little bit of context about what the campaign was and why we were there and how it all worked. Uh, talk a little bit about making apps resilient to failure and talk a little bit about making teams resilient to failure. Um, this is kind of short, so find me later and we'll talk more. Uh, so me, again, I was the director of engineering at OFA. Uh, clearly, I'm a, your typical political technologist. Uh, I started out working at Crate and Barrel, as most political technologists do, where I did uh, point of sale and uh, order forecasting stuff. And then from there, I went to Threadless. Again, the typical path, go and sell t-shirts. Um, so, I was at Threadless for several years. I helped rebuild their entire e-commerce system while it was happening, ch changing out piece by piece. Um, and then once that was done, I was done there. So I left to go figure out what was next. And so what was next was clearly re-elect a president, because that's what happens after t-shirts, if you're paying attention. Um, so. The way that I got in there is because it was all about doing exactly what I had just done at Threadless, which was rebuild an infrastructure that looked kind of like that to something that looked more like that. So I was like, I can do this. While it's in heavy use, like people are really using it. And it's not like t-shirt use, it's like the, the country use. That was kind of a different scale. So, I started about 18 months before Election Day, and so we built out this team where we were doing 18 months, seven days a week, about 18 hours a day. In my group, we had about 40 engineers that were split among seven teams. We had about 300 repositories that we were responsible for, about 200 deployed products, 3,000 servers, that was sort of our peak. We were on AWS for most everything, so it was lower a lot of the time, but it would scale to that, which was great, and higher if we wanted it. Um, a, some million views a day. The, the range here is absurd from like one or two on a slow day to tens or way more than tens. Um, we had over a million volunteers. We had about 8,000 staff, which that's something crazy, like to go from zero to 8,000 staff in less than 18 months. It's a different kind of scaling, but also super interesting. But all these metrics don't really matter because all these things were in service of one metric and one metric only, which is this number. I had no idea what this number was just because I don't know much about these things. Uh, 270 is the amount of electoral votes that you need to win an election. Um, so that's what this was all about, was getting to 270. So you guys now know more about campaigns than I did when I started. So to give you guys a little bit more context, I'm going to give you the rundown of how campaigns work in about three minutes. So there are four phases, plan, build, execute, and then GOTV. Uh, pro tip, GOTV is not a TV station. Uh, I made that mistake when I started. That means get out the vote, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So plan. The planning phase, in our, in our case, was like the first six months. Um, and that is when everybody comes with their dreams. It's like, what are the things that we can do to make this the most effective election possible? We're not moving very fast at this point. This is like the, the laid back time. Um, what that means is that for us, it was like six days a week and 12 hours a day. Um, now, what this means for technology is actually something different for what it means for the rest of the campaign. For technology, it means start building, because all those things that people are dreaming about, we're going to need the building blocks for those things when the next phase comes around so that we can actually do them. The next phase is build. Now, if you're paying attention, tech already started doing that. But this is when the rest of the organization starts building, like building up the staff, building up the teams, getting their volunteer base back. This is when we really start doing the money part. This is when we start sending a bunch of emails. Some of you may have gotten one or two of those. And then this is when we start building technology. This isn't, I mean, as I said before, we already started on the technology, but this is when we start actually building applications that people are going to use instead of just the building blocks. So for tech, 
keep building and make money. And the next phase is execute. This is sort of the last three to six months of a campaign. This is when you start using all of this stuff. So this is when all of those volunteers and all that staff go out and they talk to voters. This is when we get more volunteers, recruit people to come and help us with the purpose of what we're doing. This is where we do everything. And for technology, this means keep building, but now with actual user feedback, because we've essentially gone a year plus building these applications that all these people are going to use with almost no feedback. I don't recommend that path. Uh, and then, GOTV, that's get out the vote. That's what I talked about. This is really what it's all about. Everything that we build is in service of this. This is E-Day, Election Day. It's the last four days. So it's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and actual E-Day. This is where it all happens. So if we don't do well for GOTV, people actually don't go and vote. This is kind of a crazy thing to me. It still doesn't make sense. But if we don't go out and actually knock on people's doors and say, will you commit to go and vote? A lot of them don't. So this is what it's all about. And for tech, what this means is scale. Like, a lot of scale, like a pretty big change, like things that look like that. This is our, our call tool, um, where we went from six months until four days before doing about 1,000 to 2,000 calls a day. And then on Saturday, we did 125,000. And then on Sunday, we did 450,000. And then on Monday, we did 750,000. And then on election day, we did 1.2 million calls. That's a couple orders of magnitude from four days prior. So, you know, we have things like this also. This is the, the real-time concurrent visits, again, for the call tool, where it goes from not many to almost 2,000 in the span of about 15 minutes. Um, trying to plan for that, is really hard. So at this point, there's sort of this meme that technology won the election, which is not true at all. But technology absolutely could have lost the election. So this is our opportunity to make sure that we actually do well. <laughs> so fun, fun story about this cake. This, our, our lead DevOps guy bought this cake for us right before uh, the actual uh, GOTV. Um, and it sat there for four days because <laughs> People weren't sure if they were talking about the cake or GOTV. Uh, the very important lesson about scoping your requests. Um, so we only have one shot to handle all of this scale and to do all this stuff. So how do we do that? I mean, how do you make sure that you can handle that kind of scale change? Well, first step, make the apps resilient. OK, that sounds great. So what does that mean? Well, great, great news about that. We're incredibly brilliant. Just like everyone here, we all know what to do for that. We make sure that the apps actually do the things that matter. So is it a commerce application? Make sure that if terrible things are happening, that you can still take money. Is it a community-centered app? If terrible, terrible things happen, make sure that the users can still communicate. If, for instance, it's a campaign volunteer tool, hypothetically, make sure that people can still do work make sure that the things that matter can actually still happen. You may not know what the things are that matter. I didn't, necessarily. So you have to talk to your stakeholders. Your stakeholders are going to tell you they want all of the features in the world. Features are awesome. <laughs> Working is way cooler than features, though. You have to have these conversations, and you have to put it in context of what do you want to work when things fail. There's the wall of text. No feature is cool enough to not have a working app. As soon as you say that to a stakeholder, they're like, oh, OK. So if terrible, terrible things are happening, and we actually need everything to work, what are the things that we need to work? It's a hard conversation, but you can get everyone on your side. This isn't news to anyone in this room. It shouldn't be. This is just graceful degradation, fault-tolerant apps. We've been doing this forever. This is our job. Like, this is nothing new. That's all there is. Everyone here is great. My team was amazing. We did that. It's all that there is to do. However, technology fails. So there are two options of what we can do with that. Either we can make sure that the tech doesn't fail, or we can learn how to deal with failure. 
So the first one, making sure that the tech doesn't fail, we're going to try that. Like, you're going to try everything in your power to make sure it doesn't fail. But sometimes there are things that are out of your control. Say, for instance, uh, you have a bunch of stuff in a data center in Virginia. And say, for instance, there's a hurricane that's headed directly for Virginia. Again, hypothetically. Uh, you may not be able to, to prevent that from happening. So work on that, but make sure that you also work on making the team resilient to failure. And the way that you do that is you practice, practice, practice. So that's cool. That's fun to say, practice failure. And, but what does that actually mean? So in our case, what that meant was about six weeks before the election, we had what we called a game day. And what that meant was that we sat everybody down and we said, OK, we're going to actually build up our staging environment to look exactly like production. We're going to simulate all the traffic that we would have on production on that. And then we're going to break things. And we're going to see what happens, and we're going to react. So about six weeks before the election, we said, OK, you have two weeks to make everything as fault tolerant as you possibly can. Change all the code that you can. No features need to be developed in the next two weeks. And then on Friday, we had our big tech meeting, and we said, OK, on Sunday, come in, and we're going to start breaking things. On Sunday morning, I sent out an agenda to all of the engineers, and I said, OK, at 11.45, we're going to start, and we're going to turn off a replicant. And then we'll see how that works, and then we'll respond to that. And then at 12.15, we'll turn off the master, and we'll go from there. And there was a six hours of agenda of different things that we were going to do. And so we started, and it took about an hour before all of the engineers realized that I was lying. So all of those things were things that we were going to do, but it wasn't going to happen in that prescribed way, because real disasters aren't scripted. And you can't actually get good learning unless you're simulating real things. So I tortured 40 engineers for a day, and I still feel bad about that. Um, it was at about this point people realized that it was not game day with this kind of dice, but more game day with these kind of dice. <laughs> so without most of them knowing, we had split into two teams, where it was myself and one or two of the DevOps guys just plotting how to mess everything up. And everybody else organizing the way that they had trained to organize to respond to failure. And we did crazy things, like where they would ask the DevOps people to make a change, and they'd just not do it, but say that they did. Because that happens sometimes. Like, that, people make mistakes. Um, so we did exactly what we would normally do. We actually had two parallel streams where us, the aggressors, <laughs> uh, we organized in the exact same fashion that we had all been trained to do. So we had two parallel campfire discussions happening, two ca parallel Google Docs explaining everything that happened with all the times. And then what we did afterwards is we took those things and we matched things up and we said, OK, when this broke, this is what all of the engineers saw. So we took all that and we put together all of our learnings from it, which made all of the pain worth it. But what did we learn? We learned that there were things that we thought we had fixed that were just broken. Take, for instance, our identity provider, which uh, we had built out all of this amazing stuff to handle faults in the database. Um, but we had never applied it to our identity provider, just to our main API. So as soon as the master database went down, anything user-facing immediately broke. That was kind of a problem. It was like a five-minute fix, but let, until we had done this, we would have no idea. So we also learned what failure really looks like, which is sometimes different than how we planned. You know, we would have our idea of how these things would break, and then when it actually happened, it might act slightly differently. You know, it might surface one or two levels up, and you don't know what it is, but that's really the canary, and you can point to that thing. We learn new ways that things fail. Um, for instance, if you're using RDS, and you have a master replicant, and you, you have like four or five replicants, and then you promote one of those, replication breaks on everything, um, which is fine, so long as you know that and you can plan for it. And we now did. We also learned how to fix a lot of these things, which was great. And so we put together these run books, um, which were just instruction manuals that were like a glossary, where it's like, oh, I see this happened. 
I go and do this. And we just put that together and we put it in the repo so that anybody who had access to the code also had access to how to fix everything. So if it's 3 in the morning and terrible things are happening, every single engineer knows how to solve that problem. So it was a terrible day. I ruined these people's lives. Um, and then I sent them home. They were more stressed than they normally are. They came back in the next morning. And uh, it was, at this point, it was October 22nd. Um, we had still a couple weeks left. People were getting burnt out. And uh, it's about an hour or two into the day. Databases start failing. And everyone's like, Dylan, you have to stop doing this to us. It has been a terrible 24 hours. And it's at that point that I'm like, this is not me. I'm not doing this. So some of you may know Amazon had a little hiccup, but it was great. We had literally done it the day before. And so everybody was like, well, if that database goes out, we know exactly what to do. So they flipped to the page, and they're like, well, we'll just kill that replicant, start a new one, and move it to a different AZ. Great, cool. And so it was a non-event. So to summarize, you want to build resilient apps. The way that you do that, plan for failure. Define the things that actually matter. Make your plan clear to your stakeholders. This is a key piece. It's really hard to, to build that resiliency in unless everybody knows what it's for. And make sure that you fail to the things that matter. And then, of course, make sure that you have resilient teams. Practice failing. Learn from that failure. That's the key piece. If you just practice but don't actually learn from it, it was a waste of time. Take that, build your instruction manual, and use it. Constantly revise that, because things are going to fail in ways that you didn't anticipate, and you get to keep writing that so that you always have that to go back to. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, I am going to be around. Hit me up. Thanks. <laughs>